every year, our church encounters together a stewardship series. And so today, I want to begin our uh, stewardship series for 2017 and for this month. And it's simply called Count. The ABCs of financial success. Anybody interested in financial success? All of us. And so today we were going to begin this series, Count the ABCs of Financial Success. Here's what I know. The devil does not want me spending a month talking about money and material possessions. But we're going to do it anyway. We're going to do it anyway. And we're going to start today with, a, a, you know, this series, Count, ABCs of Financial Success. And uh, I, think the I think the best place to start is with A, for attitude. Attitude. Now, I'm, you know, I can see some of you already, so I can see some of what you're, you're thinking. Really? You're thinking, oh boy, here we go. Really? I mean, not just a sermon on money. You're, we're doing a whole series on money? Yeah, I know, I know. But we need this series. And we're going to start with attitude. Let me start with a, a little example. I'm pretty convinced that if you were to drive onto, uh, you know, any church parking lot, any given Sunday morning uh, in our country you would immediately be led to believe that, wow, those church go goers must be the best money managers on the planet. <laughs> Was that the computer? <laughs> you would be led to believe that because you would be looking around and you would see all kinds of Beamers and Benzes and, and, and uh, Rovers and, and Jags and Jeep after Jeep after Jeep. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you like how I put Jeep in the, you know, that category. But anyway, you would be led to believe, wow, these Christians must, they must be the best money managers on the, on the face of the planet. But then you would go inside the church and you would kind of take notice of the average weekly offering and you'd go, oh, seems to be a problem. And there is a problem. Do you realize the average church goer only gives 2% of his income back to God? Biblically speaking, that, that's a problem. But that's the national average. And so when I hear something like that, some questions immediately come to my mind. Especially in reference to our church family. And, and, and some of the questions are, are we... Meeting our stewardship potential. Are we doing a good enough job teaching and preaching on money and material possessions? Are we seriously in debt? Is it possible that maybe we're not as good as money managers as we think we are? Is it possible we might need a new attitude? Attitude. William James said this, one can alter his whole life by simply altering his attitude. I think that's right. One can alter his whole life simply by altering his attitude. Here's what I find interesting in scripture. Uh, the number one topic, the most important topic that Jesus ever talked about was the kingdom of God. But a close runner up was money. Isn't that interesting? It, it kind of like lends itself to maybe Jesus knew we'd need a little attitude change when it comes to money. It kind of indicates that Jesus already knew what our tendency would be. Our tendency is to love money way too much and be consumed with way too many material possessions, isn't it? In fact, 
the, na the national average about Christians says that the American Christians are spending more than 10% of their annual income in interest alone. And at the same time, only are giving 2% back to God. Biblically speaking, that's a problem. We need this series. We need this series. Some of you are going to remember Harry Truman. Do you remember Harry Truman? No, not the president. No, I'm talking about Harry Truman. Harry Truman lived in Washington. He lived on the, si the side of Mount St. Helens in 1980. Harry Truman. The news reporters had, you know, found Harry Truman and had an interview with Harry Truman. And the news reporters were basically saying, listen, the mountain is about to blow. You've got to get out of here. The seismologists and all the uh, volcanic experts were there telling him, the mountain is about to blow, you've got to leave. To which his response is, I don't believe any of your experts. I have lived on this mountain all of my life. I know this mountain better than anyone else on the face of the earth. I'm not going to leave. His sister got on national TV pleading pleading with, with him, leave, the mountain's about to blow, leave. And it's interesting that in the first interview, it was just Harry Truman and his 23 cats. And his response to his sister was even, I have lived here all my life. I know this mountain better than anybody. I am not going to leave. I don't have a problem. You know as well as I do. That on May 18th, 1980 at 8.31 a.m., the mountain blew with such great force, 500 times the force of the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. It took up uh, uh, 2,500 feet of the top of the mountain and just blew out. The sky darkened from Seattle to New York and as south as Oklahoma City. And no one's seen a trace of Harry Truman or his 23 cats. My prayer is that there is not a Harry Truman in this church family. In fact, my assumption in this series is, my assumption is that you want God's wisdom with your finances. Uh, my assumption is that you want God's guidance. My assumption is that you want his blessing on your finances. Good assumption? Somebody say, I want that. Only a couple of you, but all right. <laughs> Talking to you then. I want that. And... And look at this scripture. So, it's so inspirational. First Chronicles chapter 29. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly saying. He's speaking to all, all the people. The whole church, right? Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. See what he's doing? Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. I love that passage, and I love what David's doing. What David is doing in this passage, I love this. What he's doing is he is telling himself, and he's telling the whole church, and he's telling even us today, 
that God is sovereign over everything we have. God is sovereign over everything we have. And listen, if you really want to experience uh, financial success in your personal life and in your family life and in your business life and in our church life, we have got to adopt the attitude that David had. And we've got to acknowledge that God is sovereign over everything we have. Amen? We've got to get that. But in order for us to really get that, I think we need to start with a little attitude check. And here's what I want to do today. As we work on our attitudes about finances, um, I want to do two things. First, I would like for us to hear about some lies that sound like truth. And then let's flip it and hear about truth that's, that actually sound like a lie. Make sense? Really easy. First, let's look at some lies that sound like truth. Lie number one. All the church talks about is money. Lie number one. All the church ever talks about is money. Ah, oh, Actually, I'm pretty convinced we don't talk enough about it. We don't talk enough about it. In fact... The statistics prove that in the consequences are that the church people um, are some of the worst managers of their money when they should be the best because they got God's instruction. And the statistics prove that we're sometimes some of the worst on the planet at managing money. Why does... Um, why does the devil work so hard to get people to believe that all the church ever talks about is money? You know why he works so hard at propagating that lie? So that you're immediately offended when we bring it up. Why does he do that? So that you won't listen. But the truth is God is sovereign over everything we have. And the church probably ought to talk a little bit more about money and especially the attitude. Line number two. Money and things can satisfy me. Have, have you ever bought the end of that lie? Money and things can satisfy me. If only, I, if only I had a new car, I would be so happy. Some of you are like, if only I had a new Jeep, I would be so happy. Well, I don't you know. Well. Some of you are like, man, if only I had the brand new iPhone 10, I would be so happy, right? Yeah. <laughs> For a couple weeks, and then you'd drop it and you'd crack the screen. The truth is things can never satisfy. You know that. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, look at this. Whoever loves money never has money enough. <laughs> Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. Money and things can never satisfy. Only the Lord can. Amen? Only the Lord can. Here's, the, here's lie number three. <laughs> it's my money. I can do whatever I want to with it. Now that's a whopper to deal with right there. It is my money. I can do whatever I want to with it. Well, biblically speaking, you're a little off kilter. Do you remember Psalm 24, 1? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. You see, God is sovereign over everything we have. Even our own text, our own text today, David said, everything we give comes from you, right? Everything comes from you. And what we, what we have given is only comes from your hand. God is sovereign over everything we have. And I really love Job 1.21. You, you remember this one. Job 1.21. Naked, I came into the world. And naked, I will go out of the world. Right? You know, Sussex County. Naked, I come in. Naked, I go out. <laughs> it's the only way Randy's going to understand a scripture like that. <laughs> Randy even here. Yeah, he's here somewhere. Anyway. 
You know, you know, God is sovereign over everything we have. Well, there's a couple of lies that kind of sound like truth. So can we hear the truth? It sometimes maybe sounds like a lie. Truth number one, God is the one who determines how much money I have. Huh? What? What? God is the one who determines how much money we have. Look at this verse, Deuteronomy chapter 8. This is, wow. You may say to yourself, my power and my strength of my hands have produced all this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Our temptation is to kind of look around and say, wow, look what I've had, look what I've done, look what I've accomplished. Bubba, you have nothing to do with it. God's provided everything you have. He is sovereign over everything we have. Man, if we could get that. Truth number two. God has the power to shut down your company, your business, and your income without any notice. Oh, that's unpleasant, preacher. Well, I know, but... Isn't it, isn't it the truth? God has the power to shut down your company, shut down your business, shut down all of your income without a moment's notice. Do you remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar? You, oh, I got to remind you of this. Remember King Nebuchadnezzar? At the time, he was the most popular, most powerful man on all the earth. King Nebuchadnezzar. And one time, Daniel chapter 4 says, one time, King Nebuchadnezzar goes out and he starts looking at all of his stuff. He's out there and he starts looking at all his stuff and he's like, wow, look what I've done. Wow, look what I've accomplished. Wow, look what I've built. Wow, things are great. Wow, I'm great. Daniel chapter four, the Lord interrupts him. Look at this. Even as those very words were on his lips, a voice came down from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people, will live with wild animals. You will eat grass like an ox. Seven times will pass by before, until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. <laughs> He was driven away from the people and he ate grass like an ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. Look at this next paragraph. So, this is so awesome. At the end of the time, you know, at the end of seven times, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorify Him who lives forever and ever. Truth is, um, the Lord has the power to shut down your income at any, without any moment's notice. Because He's sovereign over everything you have. So you know what? You and I don't really need to be worried about the economy. You and I never need to worry about stock market. You know where our main concern should be? Living a life in a manner that pleases and honors the Lord. Right? One more truth. Sounds like a lie. Giving to God is the only way out of financial problems. Huh? <laughs> Giving to God is the only way out of financial problems. Jesus himself said, give. And it will be given to you. The temptation is for any of us when we start fi feeling it financially and, and we're under financial stress, the first thing cut out is what? Giving to God. And I, I've known people in the past, 
uh, who really got upset at me for taking a whole month to talk about money and they stopped giving. Man, okay, you know, you can be mad at me. Okay, that's all right. I'm just a messenger, just do, doing my best. But don't cut yourself off from the source of all blessings. And can I plead with you to understand the law of the harvest? 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Whoever sows sparingly, reaps sparingly. Whoever sows generously, reaps generously. That's God's law. And so I want you to know that you will never, you will never spend your way out of financial problems. You'll never be able to borrow your way out of financial stress. No. You'll never be able to cheat or steal or beg or gamble your way out of financial stress. Jesus said, give and it'll be given to you. Hmm. So yeah, we're going to take a month. <laughs> and in the next few weeks, we are going to discover some incredible, some personal, some practical, some very biblical principles about managing finances. Now listen, there's a new four before available. You can download it on the website. There's some copies back here. Hey, Take a four before, sit down with your family, talk about what the Lord says about finances. You want his blessing, right? And, uh, and this is really cool. And the next two Thursday nights, uh, the 9th and the 16th of November, we are hosting a, a financial seminar. In fact, you know, on each Thursday night, we're going to do two seminars kind of in one night. Um, 6.30, 6.30 to 8.30. This Thursday, next Thursday, there's a sign-up sheet back here. If you, you know, uh, we'd love for you to sign up, kind of give an indicator how many's coming. But um, uh, the next two Thursday nights, it's going to be great. If you just need a little extra boost, a little extra encouragement, how to manage your own personal finances, man, get there. And this whole month, we're going to talk about some incredible personal, spiritual, biblical principles, what God says about managing finances. But listen, if we don't apply these principles, they won't do any of us any good. You've got to. Just got to put them into practice. Listen, the Lord loves you. In fact, the Lord loves you more than you really understand. And I want you to know the Lord is for you. He's always for you. He wants to bless you like crazy. In fact, the Bible tells us He wants to prosper you. But he's allowed us to make the decision whether or not that's going to be possible. Sometimes you wish he didn't trust you that much, right? It's up, it's up to us. Probably need to start with an attitude. So I think we should pray today. Lord, I want your wisdom. Lord, I want your guidance. Lord, I'm going to follow your principles because I want your blessings on my finance. Amen? Then let's pray it together. Would you repeat after me? Lord, I want your wisdom. Lord, I want your guidance. I will follow your principles. I want your blessing on my finances. In the name of Jesus, amen.